All right, welcome back to another episode of Gay Men Going Deeper, a podcast series by the Gay Men's Brotherhood, where we talk about all things personal development, mental health, and sexuality. Today, I'm your host, Callum Brecken, and I have a very special guest, Jason June, with me. Jason is a genderqueer writer mermaid who loves to create picture books that mix the flamboyantly wacky with the slightly dark and young adult contemporary rom-coms full of love, lust, and hygiene. When not writing, JJ zips around Austin, Texas. He loves dinosaurs, unicorns, Pomeranians, and anything magical that takes you to a different world or time. JJ is a tried and true Laura Dern stan, <laughs> and he is actively looking for an Adelite friend. I love the Animorphs reference you got going. Yes. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about navigating non-binary. We're also going to be exploring questions like what is non-binary and what does non-binary mean, or what does it mean to be non-binary? What's the most important thing people need to know about non-binary and genderqueer people? And why do you think we're experiencing more of a conversation around gender and gender identities in recent years, as well as much, much more? This podcast and YouTube channel are listener and viewer supported. So if you enjoy what we're creating, you can support us by heading on over to our Patreon page and contributing to the show. You can also subscribe to the early access option on Apple Podcasts and gain early access to new episodes as soon as they come out. All your support helps us to continue making great content for you and supporting our community, and we thank you in advance. So now on to today's show. Welcome, Jason. How are you doing? Good. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, this is going to be so fabulous. And just one tiny little uh, mention. My name is Jason June, like Mary Kate, but without the hyphen or the Olsen twin. So it's a two name, first name. Uh, but feel free to also call me JJ if because I know Jason June's a little out of the ordinary for most names. I love it. I love the name. I love a good nickname as well. Like JJ, like yeah. hey JJ. So welcome. I'm so, so excited to be diving into this topic. We've not really touched in this topic. We've kind of covered it a little bit, but I'm really excited to finally be putting out an episode about this. So awesome. to start things off, let's go on the adventure of Jason and your non-binary adventure of growing up. JJ's non-binary adventure. Take us on it. I love it. So for me, I knew that I was queer as young as three. I just didn't have the words to describe it. But I remember watching The Little Mermaid over and over and over again and really being enamored with King Triton. And then if I was ever picturing myself in this like wedding scenario that you get to at the very end of the movie, which is also problematic because Ariel's 16, but whatever. That's a different, that's a whole other I never topic. actually thought about that, but yeah. <laughs> It's pretty problematic. <laughs> yeah, but uh, picturing that future, I never saw myself as the masculine energy in a wedding scenario. It was always the feminine energy. And Amen. I didn't, yeah, I didn't know how to pinpoint that. I didn't know what it was I was feeling, except I just knew what I was gravitating towards. Um, like to imagine being one of King Triton's daughters and just like basking in this wonderful feminine under the sea palace would have been so magical. Uh, and as I grew up, that I kept being pulled towards that or kept being, uh, kept repeatedly watching things that definitely had queer undertones or very blatant overtones, like movies like Labyrinth. Uh, with David Bowie and being so enamored with that bulge in his crotch being like what is that what's going on there why can't I stop thinking about it <laughs> I or, hear you, know, you I hear you yeah. or things like Tu Wong Fu I mean that's obviously like so in your face gay it's such that's my favorite movie. that is it's so favorite. good it is I, so good yeah 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 I love it and so it was as time went on it became more and more obvious that I was gay and I came out as gay in my senior year of high school, it was in a rural part of Washington State, Eastern Washington, and it was heavily religious, the community. Uh, a lot of people, when they hear Washington State, think Seattle, which is very blue and liberal, but Spokane is only 20 minutes away from Idaho, and it's way more in line with what you think of Idaho uh, ideologically than what you would think of when you think of Seattle. So there was some trepidation coming out, but I was really lucky that I had my parents' support. I had my whole family's support. Uh, my small little farming community high school, there were probably like 80 of us in my class. 
they were super supportive minus one guy who made it his mission to tell me that he did not like my lifestyle. But I mean, to have 79 people out of 80 be like, we've got your back was really unexpected and really, really magical. So that was delightful. But then like coming into my own as a gay person was magical. And I eventually moved to West Hollywood and was just like, we're in gay paradise here. But I still didn't fully feel like I fit in. And so I was trying to be this little muscle twink that you see parading around West Hollywood. And it was like the more and more I tried to fit that body image, the less and less happy I was. And uh, it went through a whole range of things, just feeling like no matter what I did, I wasn't living up to that standard. And it came into like body issues and body dysmorphia. And it wasn't until I just stopped all of that, like stopped the excessive working out and weight lifting and protein powder consuming and just let my body become this more scrawny, curvy thing that I hadn't ever seen before in myself that I realized this isn't just some, some thing. It's like who you are. It's who you are meant to be. And I really embraced my feminine side. And it wasn't until my 30s that I realized like, when it, and it was because of Gen Z creating all these different terms and throwing them into the lexicon that could actually pinpoint how I felt that I realized that I was genderqueer and femme and have just really embraced that now in my mid thirties and feel like, yeah, this is who I was always meant to be. Oh, I love that. I love that journey. I love that people at your school like really support you because I grew up in Vancouver, like in Canada, Vancouver, but yeah. like not too far away. And I'm right. well aware of like Seattle's great, but then going out anywhere else, like my mm -hmm. family mostly grew up in Washington state as well. So I'm, I'm very well aware of like how things can be in that part of yeah. the world. So right. I'm glad that you did have support other than, you know, there's always going to be that one bully, but they just have their own internal stuff that they're going through. You got to completely you know from over there thank you very much sir um and then uh I love that you know you stopped trying to live for other people and that's when you really found your own authenticity of yourself so what was that yeah. like feeling like going through that transition of being like fuck it like fuck it like what was the wall or the thing that you hit that you were like fuck it uh my fuck it moment was probably it was about three years ago and it was trying on clothes that are like coded as boy clothes and hating, hating, hating the way that they looked on me. I hate the way specifically jeans that are made for biological men or say they are quote unquote for that, even though I don't think clothes can have a gender, um, hating the way they sat on my hips. And it wasn't until I grabbed a pair of good old Khloe Kardashian's good American jeans that are very high waisted, sit above your hip that I was like, this is how I've always fucking wanted jeans to look. Sorry, I'm not supposed to curse. No, 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 swearing. <laughs> I, I know this is a swearing podcast. Okay, good. We have the explicit on every episode. Perfect, right? okay, great. <laughs> Amazing. So I was so fucking happy in those good American jeans. And it was like, and I'm not the first person to try on clothes that have been said that they're for women. Uh, but it for me, it was the first time where it was like, oh wait, no, you can do this. I had always seen male bodied people wearing feminine clothing and being like, God, they look so great. And I'm like, so enamored with their style. And it wasn't until that moment that I was like, that is what I'm going to do. That's like, I'm, I'm just going to be wearing feminine clothing from now on. And it was like a slow and steady progression. It started with those jeans and then all pants and then heels and then like any kind of top where it was like, this is how I want my body to look in clothing. And it's been really exciting and liberating. So it was for, it was from something as superficial as fashion, I guess, but that was really the thing that unlocked my confidence in myself. I love that. You had your jeans liberation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I understand that because I literally just got two pairs of jeans delivered and one fits beautifully. And I'm like, yes, these are amazing. And the other ones, they're supposed to be like, not skinny, but like slim and this and that. And I'm like, they're still so giant and baggy in the butt. I'm like, these are some straight yeah. people pants. Like these right. are some bad straight people pants. And I'm exactly. like, I'm going to have to send those back. Um, I, love I love the fashion. So predominant in the world, everybody wears mm -hmm. clothes. Like, and yeah. I mean, you know, maybe there's a couple of places that they don't, but like for the most part, we live our life <laughs> by clothes. And so to be able to feel comfortable in those is so important and to yeah. not be able to feel authentically yourself. It, it's just, it kills your soul. It's like being in the closet. It's just, it eats away at your soul and you yeah. can't express those things fully. So 
I'm really curious, what do you feel are the, are, uh, what, what is non-binary exactly? And yeah. what does being non-binary mean to you and your experience? So let's unpack what non-binary is first for those who are listening who they might not know. Yeah, so non-binary just means for a person's gender identity, they do not identify with either end of the gender binary that we've been told there is. There's a uh, man and woman, and there's very specific ways that you're supposed to act based on your genitals and your genitals alone. And uh, so to identify as non-binary means that you don't fall in that. And that's not to say that people cannot identify with the ends of the spectrum. Those are still beautiful, wonderful, valid identities. But for someone who uses the term non-binary, it means they do not feel like they are, uh, they are emblematic of what either end of that spectrum is quote unquote supposed to entail as our society uh, says it. Wow, okay, well, thank you. I've learned, I've learned a little something. And then, so what does that mean for you? Because I also know that you use he, him pronouns. And mm -hmm. so this is where some people can get confused and we're gonna unpack this a little bit later, but you know, you're know, you non-binary, but you still use he, him pronouns. And so how does that right. look for you and your interpretation of it? So that's also the beautiful and confusing thing about terms like non-binary or genderqueer, which is another term that I use for myself, is that there is no one way to be non-binary or genderqueer. It just means that you're not a part of, of those two very specific and limiting options that we are ingrained in us from the womb about how you can act and be. So for my non-binariness, it's my femininity is the overriding energy in my soul, and it's, it's how I outwardly present. And uh, I use the term non-binary because while I still like embrace my male body that I was born with uh, and feel like it is the right body for me, I also really want to embrace the femininity that for so long has been said I cannot be a part of and, and, and display myself in a feminine way. So I still use he, him as sort of a tribute to my body uh, the actual physical attributes that make it up. But I also go by she, her pronouns. If um, people are picking up on the way I present myself, that there's a very specific reason why I present this way. It's because I do identify with feminine uh, energies in general. And she, her has been uh, coded as feminine in our society. And so when I, when people when people will refer to me by she, her, especially strangers at large, and especially in masks, if you can only see my eyes and above, uh, people automatically think I'm a biological woman. And that's totally fine. Like I'm presenting this way for a reason. So for me, that's my sort of makeup, why I would use both he, him, and she, her. And, uh, and I'm just kind of like, I feel like I, while I don't feel like I am on either end of the gender binary, I do feel like I'm in between it somewhere. So sometimes non-binary doesn't always feel like the best term for me. I still use it because I'm just sort of embracing the fact that I'm not on either end, but I do feel like that since I'm in between that a lot of my buying, a lot of my being still is represented by uh, the images and energies that we have made up in the binary itself. Um, so a lot of times I'll use gender queer so as not to uh, not to kind of dilute or confuse the message from other people that feel like they're not a part of the binary at all. And that's mm -hmm. why they use non-binaries because they're trying to be like, I am non in the system, <laughs> you <Yes>. know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And I do love that about the LGBTQ plus community. We do have, like, we are the originals being outside the boxes. And that's mm -hmm. why I think so many of us have been able to explore so many other aspects of ourselves. And it's, you know, it comes with its bag of shit. But the fact that we broke outside of that box, we're like, well, I'm already outside of the box. I might as well explore other aspects of me. And that's why so many of these beautiful experiences have been birthed from that because we've been the community who says, you be yourself. Like, yeah. you know, nobody has it figured out. Just go on your journey. And as long as you're enjoying your journey and other, you know, you're not doing anything wrong to anybody else, then like have at it and have fun. Um, I do think people can get very confused because there are a lot of terms and there are a lot of yeah. like identities and I think what people um need to know about that is that it's not about 
being right about it. It's about mm-hmm. wanting to get it right and the intention yeah. that's behind it. So we're definitely going to, we're going to unpack that a little bit later. Um, but I want to continue on. So what do you feel are the most important things people need to know about non-binary and gender queer people? I think the, you know, and I want to give a caveat to this whole conversation that I am not the expert on non-binary yes. and gender queer existences. And that's but the I can, thing, everybody has yeah. a different take on it. So this yes. is just one individual's take. Exactly, yes. exactly. So I think one of the most important things to remember is uh, when you are interacting with a non-binary or gender queer person, um, don't put your baggage onto that person. And I know that's really hard to do because this is a prison house of gender that we have had ingrained in us from birth, especially people who are older than Gen Z, uh, where, because what's really magical interacting with Gen Z people and younger is seeing all kinds of queer people existing in schools, existing in colleges that, and so it seems like way more and more your cisgender and or straight classmates are exposed to queer experiences and are a little more liberated on that front. But for older than Gen Z, when you're interacting with somebody who's displaying their gender in a way that you don't think is traditional, to use a lame word like traditional, <laughs> um, give them respect and don't put, don't put the baggage that you've got ingrained in your subconscious, and for some people in their blatant conscious who want to like reinforce the very rigid gender roles. Um, don't, if you expect somebody to be male bodied just from the way that you look at them, don't get into the nitty gritty of that. Don't ask them about like, don't ask about their very private lives that really it should only matter for them, their partners and their doctors, unless they're willing and ready to have that conversation with you um, because they want to help teach you about new ways of being. And also respect that these, this person or people that you're interacting with is saying, I'm not a part of the binary. So if you think this person is male bodied or female bodied, don't unload the baggage of how you think a person with that type of body is supposed to interact and how you're supposed to interact with them when you're having that. And that's kind of a really convoluted way to just say, come at them from a neutral playing field. Don't, um, don't be that person you're like, oh, I think they're female body. I need to hold the door open for them when you wouldn't do it for somebody who's male bodied. Do just treat everybody as equal and do that for your cisgender friends too. <laughs> you know, where it's like, don't, there's a lot of baggage that we have to unlock. Uh, and most of it is subconscious. And I think most people are really well intentioned. But if somebody gently calls you out on it, don't get defensive and just be like, hey, this is a great learning moment um, for everybody involved, you know? Yeah. I love, I love so much of what you just said about don't put your baggage on other people. Yeah. Um, cause it reminded me of this. I, w- I watched Oprah like a hundred years ago and there was a woman who like had lost her memory or something. And she said something along the lines of, I'm going to butcher this, but like be responsible for the energy that you bring into the room because yeah. she had no filter. And so it was like, whatever you brought to the room, it was like, I believe you. It's like, you know, dealing with kids, whatever you say to them, they're going to believe you because they haven't developed that part of their brain. And so yeah. if you come at life with just respect for all the people you interact with regardless Mm -hmm. of what they present as or who they want to be or you know what political party they are or whatever I always come at life from the angle of I respect everybody to the point that I'm willing to come to the table to listen to you to hear you but that does not mean I will agree with you. Yeah. And respect does not mean that I will agree with you or that I agree with you. And I can very much disagree with a lot of things, but I'm still willing as a human being to be capable of having those conversations because I think that the world has gone in so many far different directions and like polar opposites that nobody's willing to come into the middle anymore. And I think having this conversation around gender and gender identities and non-binary, when people get really stuck in those, you know, far ends of the binaries, they're like, no, it has to be this way. I just encourage you to kind of take a step back and, and, you know, get curious as to why you think that way and why Mm -hmm. you have those beliefs. And if you're capable of maybe giving yourself that grace in order to be able to come to the table and sit there and be respectful when having these conversations. Cause it really doesn't matter for me. I don't care who you are, what you present is, as long as, yeah. you know, I know 
that I can ask you and then you can let me know in a respectful way of like, what are your pronouns? What do you want me to use? And then I yeah. try my best. I might not be perfect sometimes, but I try my best to use that. I think it, a lot of it comes to the intention as well, right? Completely, completely. I think in my experience in real life, I think there, cause you know, online, we know there are terrible, horrible trolls that specifically make it their point to Keyboard come into words. your space and tell you that you're wrong. But in real life, when I'm interacting with people, the vast majority of the time, everyone has a really good heart and good intentions and just wants to learn, which is really nice. Um, I think for those people that are so, I think there is, there's kind of two camps of people when they, when you're talking about this in real life, where it's either, I'm just so confused and I want to learn more. And just like you said, I might get stuck in the way things have been ingrained in me and, and mess up and everything. And some of the things I might say might sound kind of ignorant, but truly at the heart of it, I'm trying to get better. That's amazing. And then there's another camp of people where they're just, they cannot get past the obstacle and are of the obstacle of the gender binary and will insist that based on your genitals, you need to act a certain way. And when you call it out to them, where it's like, we're having this conversation, but you're the one that's thinking what's between my legs. And I'm not thinking about, uh, I'm not thinking about that about you. That's usually kind of like this aha moment for well-intentioned people in real life. I'll say you can, you can have really logical, perfectly clear explanations online and it's not going to work. But in real life, oh, we know. <laughs> yeah, right. In real life, when you're like, listen, you're thinking about my dick right now, and I'm not thinking about yours, or I'm not thinking about your vagina. Who should we really be examining here as the quote unquote, you know, wrong person or perverted person or whatever terrible word you want to put on that? It's not me because I'm not the one that's obsessed with other people's genitals. It's you. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think this is ties perfectly into what Brene Brown always says is she says, I'm here to get it right, not to be right. And mm -hmm. I think people who are stuck in those binaries want to be right. And yeah. maybe they've come up with, a, you know, they, they got energy from being right and like being right played something in their life. It, it's like, you know, the winning concept, like if I'm right, I'm winning and like yeah. they have to win it life and they get stuck in that energy and yeah wanting to get it right is more about being curious and being open. And even if I'm showing up and I'm getting it wrong, I'm still showing up and I'm trying to get it right. And that I think a lot of people in today's world, especially the keyboard warriors are missing the concept of genuine, genuinely trying and just, you know, showing up to the conversation in a yes. open and honest way. Um, and I think that this really plays well into the next question, which is non-binary isn't new. It's been around for like generations. Why yeah. do you think we're experiencing more of a conversation around gender identities in recent years? You're so right. It is not new. Like it's literally been around for millennia. The term might've been different, not non-binary, but there have always been people that are outside of or within the gender spectrum and or the gender binary. And that's so magical. Uh, I think right now we're having a lot of conversation about it because in our in our recent past the the gender binary has been enforced so rigidly that it reached a breaking point and that probably timed in with the invention of social media and getting to have all walks of life all of a sudden like blasted out worldwide and people are saying there are so many other ways to live and there's young queer kids or, or closeted queer people or people who are out and queer but know there are other depths to their queerness that they haven't unlocked yet that are seeing people live their true authentic selves and giving them an example of how they could be living, which is what happened for me, seeing all these other people live their femme fantasy and being like, this is what I need to be doing. And I think that's why we're having this conversation now that, I mean, like, you know, a couple hundred years ago, the manliest men wore huge powdered wigs, powdered their face for the back row and wore chunky heels everywhere. And that was like, you were a manly, powerful man. And that's very feminine by today's standards. Yeah. And so in, you know, since the advent of our country and specifically the, the United States of America experience, everything was, it's either this or that. And uh, you are either one of the, to you're a man or a woman, 
uh, you're free or you're a slave. And it's like, that's, that's the founding of, of America is on a Democrat or you're a Republican. Right. Or whatever the parties were when the country first started. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you're either, or, and we're going to really enforce that. And in order to change the either, or there's huge amounts of upheaval and like, and we see that through the history of America, that it's like, in order to get out of the, this or that, there's got to be some kind of like revolutionary thinking and revolutionary moment. And, uh, Right now, I think we're having this sort of revolution of gender that's going on because of the internet specifically, where it's like, we've always existed, but we haven't been able to see each other exist outside of our little bubbles. And sometimes we made safe little queer bubbles in specific cities, but now we're connected worldwide. And now we're seeing multitudes of ways of existing that are just so beautiful and wonderful. And and we're reaching this golden age, like. For me, I'm an author, and I think we're in this golden age of queer books where we're getting books that represent all kinds of letters of the beautiful rainbow alphabet soup, all kinds of gender identities, all kinds of races, all kinds of religions and socioeconomic classes. And because we're thriving like that, that's why we're seeing this increased uh, attack on our experience is uh, people who are insisting on the gender binary and these really rigid rules. are coming at us hard because they're seeing us thrive so much right now. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, they're scared of that. Yes, which is perfect because change tends to scare people. Um, The current conversation around gender and gender norms is, you know, no different. So how can someone who wants to be progressive support their loved ones without letting the fear of getting it wrong hold them back? Like how can people be supportive and respectful while discussing these topics? I think one of the first things that you can do that is also um, like sort of maybe feels a little more safe is pick up a book about and by a queer person that is outside of your experience because you're just reading the pages and you're just learning about that person from their point of view in the book. And it's totally like you get to digest it. You get to think of it in your own terms and in your own time. And the more books you read outside of your experience that are specifically in the queer experience will help open your mind a little more and give you a little bit more vocabulary or a little bit more knowledge of different communities that then when you're ready to take that step to having like an audible actual conversation with another person, you already have a little bit of knowledge. And I think for me, at least, it's always a great moment where at the beginning of any conversation, if you can just acknowledge, hey, I don't know a lot about your experience and I want to do better. I'm trying to learn more. So if there's anything I say that's wrong or hurtful, please correct me and let me know. And I think just saying that, please correct me and let me know and coming at it from a true genuine spot and not getting defensive will open so many doors and allows you, allows you the grace from that other person, or at least when you're talking with me for you to screw up and for you to mess up. And even if you say something that I think is, whoa, we really need to unpack that. uh, It's, I already know you want to be a better person and you want to really accept me and feel like you can be there for me. So we're gonna unpack this. And this isn't gonna be about attacking you. It's gonna be about like pinpointing the spots where uh, what you're saying or how you've previously led your life maybe could be hurtful to somebody else. And we're on this journey together to make it better. You know? Mm -hmm. Yes, getting curious opens the door for having these kinds of conversations. And it's the difference between somebody who maybe wants to learn, but doesn't have the language around it. And so they say something to somebody and then that person then takes it as an attack. And so then they come back attacking because both people's backs are now up against the wall. And they're like, well, I'm going to come back at you. And it's learning to lead with the curiosity of being like, I'm probably going to get this wrong but I want to ask some questions because even those like that simple thought process of like I'm going to fuck it up just know you're going to fuck it up nobody's perfect and it's okay but I think we have this built-in idea that you have to be perfect that we have to be perfect and no human being is perfect and so if you let yourself off the hook with that and lead with curiosity you're going to be way more open to learning and I love 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 that you said to read books um because that's one of the best ways that i've learned like that's how i've learned everything in my life is by reading yeah 
And I made a promise to myself during when the pandemic started is like, okay, I've not really ever read queer books. I'm going to read LGBTQ based books through the pandemic because I really want to learn more about my community. But I also want to read books that are relevant to me and my experience. And yeah. at first it was really uncomfortable to read a sex scene between two guys. Like I was like, why am I so uncomfortable about this? And it was <gasps> That's because interesting. I, yeah, because I'd never been experienced to it in that manner before. And I was like, okay, well, I need to unpack this for myself. But then the yeah. more that I read it, the more it normalized it in my own mind. And I'm a very out and proud gay man. I've ran nonprofits. Right. Like I am here, I'm queer, get used to it. And yeah. so books really are um, an avenue that you can take that are just so gentle and easy that nobody else needs to know that you're doing it, that mm -hmm. it can just introduce you to so many more of these concepts that you can go, ah, I get that aha moment to lead you to that place where you do have these conversations, like you were saying. So I think that that is so beautiful and so amazing. And that also leads perfectly into the next topic, which is how has your experience influenced the writing that you do? It always gives me little seeds of, of, a story, but then the vast majority of the rest of it is fiction. So like with Jay's Gay Agenda, my first young adult novel, it was following Jay, who was the only out queer kid in his rural Eastern Washington high school, which I mean, that was my experience. I was the only out queer kid in my rural high school. Um, but then from there, the, the sequence of events is very different from my life versus uh, my character's lives. But I always try to explore some facet of life that I think is relatable for the queer experience, for some people within the queer community. So like with Jay, so many of us know what it's like to be the only out person and feel like we are kind of behind our straight classmates in terms of relationship milestones, because when you're the only out one, how do, how do you handhold and kiss and date when nobody is out to say they want to do that? So you could be like Jay, a senior in high school and still feel like you're in middle school because you haven't even had, you haven't even held somebody's hand romantically before. Um, or with my new book, Out of the Blue, I think a lot of queer people have as part of their identity love for a place. And whether that's because you grew up somewhere that you really, really loved and embraced and that's a part of you, or it's because you grew up somewhere that didn't embrace you and then you found a city that did and that becomes a part of you. We, we bodily, we have physical reactions to being in this physical space that we love. And then we can meet a person or people that we fall in love with and either they have to move away because of, because of jobs or school or whatever, or uh, they, you meet them away from where you live, but fall in love for them there. And we have these kind of conflicting loves of love for a place and love for a person. And how do we make these, how do we make these work if we literally can't be with both at the same time. And so that's kind of what I'm exploring in Out of the Blue through Crest, who's a mer person. And they literally have to choose between going back into the ocean forever or staying on land forever. And is, is this cute guy they've fallen for in their time on land enough to override the love for their home that they'll never be able to go back to? And it's those little like seeds of my life experience that, that, Th that find their way into my books oh I love that I love I love that you're bringing all the goodness of the queer books to the world and all that kind of stuff so um I, I want to talk a little bit about this um coming out uh, for you said something like you know gays don't come out at the same time we don't experience the same dating life as you know straight people they get to do that all through like school and middle school and high school and like we kind of yeah. have to wait until after we come out, which is sometimes after high school. And right. um, I want to speak to that experience of like being older gay men. And when they come out, because I've worked with people who are in their 60s and coming out and they're yeah. kind of having this renaissance where they are finally allowed to go to the club and, and like go out and have fun and take their shirt off and do all this. And there can that can come with judgment from the gay community of being uh -huh. like, well, who's this old man doing this? And <laughs> I think people need to take a step back and realize that like we don't have the same sexual journey that heteronormative people have. We don't exactly. get to do that through school. So if you see somebody doing that, for me, I always focus on like, you get yours, you go girl. Like, yeah. Because I'm just happy that this is a person who finally gets to embrace their truth and their story. And whatever negativity yeah. and stuff you got going inside of you, maybe it's time that you get a therapist and talk about that. Because Completely. I'm getting really tired of people <laughs> just attacking other people. Like grow up, 
get a therapist, do the work, figure it out. There's lots of community programs and other things out there where it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, yeah. And I just, I just wanted to say that because I need to say that because you said that we don't have that. Is, is there maybe a story about that eventually in your future, exploring that? Well, you know, first I totally agree that it's like, it's, there's no one right way or time to come out. We're each on our own journey. And so to, to judge when somebody else felt safe enough to come out is, is not yours to judge. That's theirs to figure out when is their right time. So I'm totally in agreement on that. And same, I know many, many, many people that have come out in their late thirties or beyond uh, because for whatever circumstances they were in, it just wasn't right and it just wasn't safe. And the best thing we can do is be so supportive of them when they finally feel safe enough to enter a big, wonderful queer family out and proud that's so magical. Um, but then about a story, that's been what's really great about Jay is his, in Jay's gay agenda, his kind of delayed in his mind, even though he comes out, uh, he comes out in freshman year, but since he's not of high school, but since there's nobody, no other out person to have these relationship milestones with, he doesn't get that until he's 18. And so he feels so far behind. And that's what the whole story is exploring, how we can kind of rush into catching up with everybody else when we finally uh, when we finally get to be out and around other out people and date and have sex and be romantic and physical uh, for the first time. And that was really fun to kind of explore the messiness of that when we when we kind of jump in head first to have all those experiences without kind of slowing down and taking a minute to enjoy the ride and to make sure that everyone else that's involved in this brand new sexual and romantic awakening is is also at the same pace that also wants to go that fast or that slow and all that. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting aspect that I think so many of us have when we finally get to come out and like embrace ourselves. Yes. Yes. And I love that. I'm really curious, what's your experience been um, being, you know, genderqueer, non-binary and being an author and there is this kind of renaissance of queerness in books, which is, mm -hmm. I, I, I love it. I'm watching it, I'm following it, um, but it's still very, very fresh. What yeah. is it like working with um, in that world and how have you been received in the quote unquote traditional publishing world? And what does that landscape now look like or what's it starting to look like? Um, it's been a really great journey in terms of both the acceptance of other queer authors that are currently making work right now and my shout publishers. out to Robbie Couch who was on the podcast <laughs> yes Robbie's <laughs> so amazing um so amazing and his new book Blame for the Wind is so good it's like a queer legally blonde it's so cute I love it um but that's one of the things that I really loved about the queer community is it feels like everyone's trying to look out for our own and make sure that debut authors are feeling safe and supported. And then as we're continuing down the journey that we're all in constant communication with each other. And most of it's just online, like the vast majority of my colleagues I've never even met in real life, but I just adore their work and feel like our books have a conversation with each other, even though they're in separate universes. Um, and so that's been really, really, really great, especially during this time where we're seeing so many book bans that we're all trying to figure out ways that we can get our books into the hands of the queer readers who really need them the most and how we can fight back against book bans. It's been, it's weird to say that's been nice in such a strange, horrifying time, but it's at least nice to know that we have each other's backs in this time and that we're not fighting this fight alone. Uh, we're doing it with each other. And then from the publishing side, it's been really awesome that like every time, like when I pitched Jay's Gay Agenda to my publisher, they were like, we love this title. They didn't push back about having a potentially controversial phrase like Gay Agenda in the title. They were so on board for it. And they originally signed me when I was under my old name of Jason Gallagher before I had become into my gender queer self and change my name to Jason June. And when I had the name change, they were like, yep, we're on board. There was not even a second of like, what do you mean? How do we do this? They're like, amazing. We're so excited for you. And 
they've been really, really, really lovely. And they know every time they get a new pitch from me that it's going to be very, very gay. And they are always like super jazzed about it, which I love. <laughs> I love hearing that. I love hearing that the traditional publishing world is, at least for your experience, has people in its realms that are like, no, it's time we're making this happen. Because mm -hmm. I think it is so overdue to have like a gay Lord of the Rings or a gay, you know, like bros, the movie bros is coming out. I'm looking yes. forward to it where it's just so true and authentic where it's just like, no, yep. gays do live different lives. We are not yes. the same people, but we can yes. still appreciate and value those people. It doesn't mean like I, we, I watch straight movies. It doesn't mean I want to be straight. I value it, but it's not my journey, but I could still enjoy the entertainment of it. Exactly. And like Fire Island comes out today, I think. Joel Kim Booster and Bowen Yang's new uh, rom-com on Hulu. I'm so excited to watch it. Oh my and goodness, like that's, yes. That's the thing is we need stories in all mediums of art to that explore the queer experience from queer creators so that we can show like, we do, just like you said, we do live different lives. We have common tropes that are common for the queer experience that you might not understand or get in the straight world. And that's okay. You don't have to understand or get them, but let us have our art where we do and we can celebrate it and, and laugh at it and cry with it and just like have the best time having all these emotions evoked in us, which is the whole point of art. And I'm just so excited about that. And I hope that despite all the crap that constantly gets flung at us, like in things like these censorship and banning efforts that that the big capitalist conglomerates who are picking the stuff up, keep picking it up and understand that even if the audience might not be as big or whatever for a yet. gay specific work yet, exactly, that it doesn't mean it's not worthwhile and it doesn't mean that you still can't make a shit ton of money off of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, I, I wrote <laughs> down a, a word, I circled it here is visibility. And I think that this perfectly wraps up our whole conversation here today. Um, because visibility really is the key to a lot of these things that we've been discussing. Visibility yeah. is the key to the conversations. Visibility is the key to understanding. Visibility is the key to curiosity. Visibility is how you started your journey of seeing other people doing it. And so I think it's just so important that we're providing these or being provided these platforms, but also providing these platforms to people so that they can be visible so that somebody else out there, you know, listening or watching can look and go, oh, I resonate with that. Something they yeah. said really sits with me and yeah. I want to explore that. And I think that more begets more begets more. And that's what social media has brought for us is it's brought this visibility, which is why we're having all the conversations, which is why the polar opposites are coming out because you know people get really scared about change, but it's the only inevitable thing in life. Life is constantly changing. So either you can get on board with change and learn how to live with it, or you can push against it, but it's still going to happen anyways. Right. Exactly. It's still going to happen. And it's like, it doesn't matter how many books you ban. It doesn't all of a sudden make it so queer people don't exist because the book is not in the library anymore. We're, we're still here. And yeah. so we're constantly going to be creating things for ourselves and for the world. And it's like, this is a, it's might be a tough battle, but it's going to be a losing battle for the people that are trying to squelch our existence. It's like, we we cannot be squelched. <laughs> we're here. We're queer. Get used to it. That's right. <laughs> oh my goodness. This has been such a lovely conversation. Just kind of navigating the ins and outs of like gender queer, non-binary and all the good stuff with it. Um, if people are curious, where can they find out more information about JJ? You can go to my website, heyjasonjune.com or on any social media platform. I'm at heyjasonjune, except for Facebook, because I don't like Facebook. But I'm on all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, and then uh, what are the, you have two books, correct? Yeah, so my uh, debut young adult novel came out last year, Jay's Gay Agenda, about a very type A Virgo list maker who, when he's finally around other queers, gets to knocking off all the items on his romance to-do list that he calls his gay agenda. And all the hilarity and shenanigans and mess ups that happen with that. And then my new book that came out this week that I'm so excited about is Out of the Blue. And it's sort of a gay reimagining of Splash or the Little Mermaid where a mer person comes on shore for the first time and falls in love with a cute lifeguard when they fake date. And it just, I really love it so much. 
Oh, I love that. Perfect. So if you're listening and you're curious and you want to start learning more, highly suggest getting the books and just peeking around because they always refer like other books. If you're on like at the Amazon store, they always recommend the other books. Go and peek around and see maybe there's other ones that also call out to you that you're like, oh, maybe I'll look here, maybe over there. Um, So thank you so much for being on today's show. I'm so excited for this to come out. Um, And we will catch you next time. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. I want to say to listeners, if you've enjoyed today, please give us a thumbs up on YouTube if you're watching over there and hit subscribe and hit the bell. Uh, It'll remind you when we release new episodes every Thursday. You can also give us a star rating on Apple, iTunes, or also Spotify does star ratings now. Um, We would really appreciate that. And leave us comments. We love reading them out before episodes. um, And we love hearing from you. So that's it for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. Bye, everybody. Bye.